All right, we're going to get started this morning with an invocation delivered this morning by Pastor Jason Gaddis of Southwest Baptist Church. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, it's a blessing to be here this morning, and uh, Lord, we thank you for our city. Thank you for the blessings that you gave us in this past year, and Lord, as we look ahead uh, to this new year, we want to thank you for all that you have done and recognize also that great wisdom is needed in this place and uh, lord we thank you for these men and ladies that serve so well and everyone that is represented here and so we pray for mayor and pray for the other city officials and leaders god that you might bless them and protect and use in a great way bless their families and uh, lord we thank you for your goodness to us in jesus name amen <clears throat> Councilman Greiner, would you mind uh, leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice All right, I call this meeting of the City Council to order. We have one item under Office of the Mayor. It is a resolution of commendation for James D. Couch, our City Manager, who is on his last day on the job after 18 years as City Manager. And uh, we've just got a couple hours worth of program now that we're going to begin. <laughs> and to do that, I'm going to make my way down to the front. All right. Well, I think everybody in the horseshoe is going to obviously have a few words to say, but maybe so they know they don't have to cover your bio. We'll start with, I've had to think this morning about how to stage all this, but we're going to start with the reading of most of the resolution honoring you, all the whereases, so we can kind of be reminded of your greatness. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, thought that would set the right tone. So, Francis, if you wouldn't mind reading the whereases from the resolution. Whereas James D. Couch was hired as Director of Water Resources on August 17, 1987, and appointed as MAP's Program Director, Assistant City Manager on February 6, 1998, and appointed City Manager on November 9, 2000. Whereas James D. Couch was the 28th City Manager under the Council Manager Form of Government established in 1926, and the longest serving city manager with 18 years, two months, and over 31 years of public service to the city of Oklahoma City. Whereas James Couch, as chief administrative officer, was responsible for the management and day-to-day -day operation of 4,700 employees and a total budget of $1.57 billion. Whereas James D. Couch served on the Oklahoma City's Airport Trust, Water Utilities Trust, Zoological Trust, and the Central Oklahoma Transportation and Parking Authority. And whereas James Couch served as General Manager of the Water Utilities Trust, McGee Creek Authority, Metropolitan Area Schools Trust, Riverfront Redevelopment Authority, Economic Development Trust, Municipal Facilities Authority, the Public Property Authority, and the Environmental Assistance Trust. Whereas he served the Oklahoma City community on the Downtown Oklahoma City Board of Directors, Allied Arts, Oklahoma Fair Board, the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, and as an ex officio member of the Oklahoma Health Center Foundation and Chairman-elect of United Way of Central Oklahoma and President of the Oklahoma Municipal League. Whereas during his tenure as city manager, he led efforts to ensure the city's long-term access to dependable water sources by securing rights to Canton Lake and Sardis Lake. And he negotiated two agreements with the NBA to relocate the New Orleans Hornets and the relocation of the Oklahoma City Thunder, putting Oklahoma City on the international sports stage. Whereas City Manager Couch managed $340 million for the 2000 GO bond projects, $835 million for the 2007 GO bond projects, 
972 million for the 2017 GO bond projects, 390 million dollars for the Metropolitan Area Projects Capital Construction Program, 514 million dollars in sales tax, 180 million dollars for school bond projects for the Oklahoma City Metropolitan Public Schools, and 777 million dollars for the MAPS 3 program. Whereas during his tenure as city manager, he has served 27 council members, three mayors, and appointed 14 of the 15 current department directors. Thank you, Francis. We'll leave it there, but we will return to that resolution in a few minutes. We close there with the thoughts of uh, <clears throat> the reminder that you appointed 14 of the 15 current department directors. Who, who is the 15th? Diana. Diana Barry. She outlasted you. Okay. Wow. So, <laughs> and Debbie, right. Um, but one of those department heads uh, specifically asked this morning to make a special presentation. So why don't we go there now. Uh, Chief City, if you'd like to come forward, I'll give you the mic and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to present uh, the city manager with an empty box this morning. <laughs> and it's only empty because this afternoon after 5 o'clock, we, we, we uh, had a new flag, Oklahoma City, City of Oklahoma City flag, flown in front of the City Hall this morning. It's going to fly all day on his last day. We're going to have the honor guard fold it and place it in this box for his last day on the job. And it, well, yeah. <clears throat> so, so there is. So, so on the box is presented to City Manager James D. Couch, City of Oklahoma City, August 17, 1987, to January 2, 2019. This flag was flown at City Hall on January 2nd. 2019, the final day of the longest serving city manager in Oklahoma City's history. During his 18 years as city manager, he has left a legacy, as well as unselfishly helped others define theirs. Oklahoma City will forever be a better place for his commitment to our community. Thank you very much. Well, now I thought we might go around the horseshoe. Uh, you don't have to speak, um, but uh, <laughs> but this is this is our final moment. We've all had opportunities, I think, to say a few words over the last few months since the announcement of your retirement. But uh, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this is the final day. So why don't we start with Ward One? Okay. Yep. Well, Jim, on our uh, first meeting after I got elected, it was about six years ago. You talked a lot about unity and the civility of the council and uh, and how it was so important to our success and how a lot of other cities don't have that and I think that you are a credit to to that aspect of our council because you, you somehow have a gift of taking nine different ideas and about the same subject and coming up with a solution that most of us, and, some, and a lot of times, all of us are okay with, even when we, even when we disagree. And so, I think that, as far as dealing with the council, that is uh, um, a gift that you have and, and and will be missed. And so, I think that this council, the the city, is going to uh, miss you greatly. And I think that the citizens of Oklahoma City, even though they might not even know that they're going to miss you, are going to miss you. And uh, so, I want to thank you for your hard work, dedication your common sense and, uh, and your friendship, and I wish you the best with uh, everything that, that they do going forward. I just want to keep it simple. There's a lot that could be covered, but I just want to focus again on what I consider your, your most important contribution to the city's future. I think if the scientists are correct and uh, climate change decimates coastal cities the way that we think it will, there will be a migration inward, uh, and those cities that have secured water uh, will thrive. And I think you are the person that is the most important in securing not just years of water for the city, but decades. Uh, and this will become more and more important as the century progresses. Uh, and I just can't express my gratitude, my gratitude for my kids and future generations. And I hope that um, this council and future councils can help connect those dots, because I think 50 years from now, a lot of the things will, will be forgotten. But that's, that's the one thing that I think needs to be associated with Jim Couch, and I hope that we can help connect those dots uh, for the history books. I'm also very grateful that you'll, your skills will now be uh, 
uh, working with the United Way and all the people that will benefit from your skills. And I'm grateful that you're, that you're going to be working with them. Thanks, Jim. Jim, it's been an honor to serve under you as, your, as the city manager of Oklahoma City all these years. Thank you so much for your commitment to the citizens, but thank you for your personal character and the uh, trail that you've blazed as far as personal integrity and for the legacy that you're going to leave in the lives of not only the citizens, but the staff that you've put together. And I see your wife down here. Congratulations. And um, God bless you as you go into retirement. I think everybody used every word I'd planned on using. But uh, Jim, I, I would just like to say thank you so much for all that you've done uh, for the city. As a city councilman, I really have appreciated your transparency when, when discussing issues um, and, and your ability to be forthright in your communication. Um, so as a councilman, I really have appreciated that. But I can tell you as a, a citizen of Oklahoma City, I really, really do appreciate your, your tenure here and wish you nothing but the best going forward. Jim, having worked with city managers in three cities and having worked with you, there is none other comparable. I appreciate all the confidence you have in staff and that you've had in me over the years, and uh, you will certainly be missed. Yeah, I would just say I'm coming from a different perspective because all of you all have been his bosses, and um, I've worked for him for 18 years, and I couldn't have had a better boss. And uh, he's he's just been a mentor for me and a friend, and he has been a mentor to so many people within the city. And really, I think someone said his legacy. He has set the stage for us going forward, and really not only did great things in the work that he was doing, but set us in a position that we could continue that on. And I'm just grateful for his leadership and his friendship. Jim. I, I don't know if you're aware, but I am your longest tenured appointment, uh, going, going back to 2002. And I just want to thank you for, for teaching me what the true meaning of a public servant is, uh, not only by your leadership, but just watching you in day-to-day -day operations. Thank you for the opportunity. Jim, thank you for all your, your work here as a city manager. Um, and personally, you've been so helpful to me, and I'm sure for every other member of the council. When we first take on this role, uh, I don't think anybody really understands what their responsibilities are, and you really help us get through that uh, learning stage, which takes about, I'm going to say, 12 years uh, <laughs> uh, to really understand this. But here's the important thing, and I think this can contributes to the fact that nationwide city managers have a pretty low uh, tenure. Each of us just have one ward to be responsible for other than the mayor who has the whole city. But Jim, you've got all 4,000 employees, all the issues that affect us individually as, as members of the council, and uh, it just never ceases. And, and you're just a tremendous hard worker I appreciate that. You're a great example for all of us, for all the employees of the city of Oklahoma City. And this city would not be as successful and as nice of a place to live without you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Couch, uh, you were retiring as I was coming in. Uh, but I appreciate your <coughs> guidance and your excitement uh, just to let me know uh, more about the city, more of your involvement in the city, and uh, just what to expect uh, when representing Ward 7 in the city of Oklahoma City. So I appreciate you for that. And I also I want to commend your lovely wife uh, for sharing you with us, the city of Oklahoma City, for so many years. And thank you and enjoy retirement. You know, this weekend I was working on the agenda and I just stopped for a moment and, uh, and just thought about Jim Couch for a minute. And I wrote down on a card three things. I think, I think this city has been great because Jim has followed three basic principles in my mind, and, and, I, and I've learned from those principles. Um, the, the, the city's been successful because you are a great man of honesty, and uh, you have always spoken the truth. Uh, you have always been straightforward. Uh, you have always been a person that if you said something, you could take it to the bank. Uh, it was the truth. 
The second thing, I think that you have this great quality to be transparent. And uh, what I mean by that is that uh, we don't have to guess about what you were, we never had to guess about what you were doing. If there was an issue, you outline, uh, outlined what needed to be done with the issue, you dealt with the issue, and you helped us to understand what it was so we could communicate it. So you were always transparent, maybe sometimes a little bit to a fault, because once in a while a couple of people may have disagreed with you, but that was very, very rare. Um, the, third, the third factor that, that you have instilled in all of us and helped make this city so successful in my mind, and, and I think this is very, very important, is that you were always prepared. Whenever you walked into the room, in my opinion, you were the most uh, prepared per person in the room. And um, the, the, the city manager deals with so many complicated issues and so many different issues and things that can change just in an instance. I, I know one night I was with, with Jim and it's a phone call and it's not a good phone call. Uh, but he deals with it because he was prepared. And then, like Ed mentioned, uh, uh, the water. Uh, for our kids and our grandkids to have adequate water through 2060. What a, what a complex issue that you dealt with, uh, always being prepared. And then the other issues, like the scooters and the house sharing and the, and the uh, digital billboards. And, and then my favorite one is the, uh, the parking meter with the, with the credit card that I never can figure out, and that's just me. But um, <laughs> the, the point of it is, um, that you have these basic principles that you have followed and that you have taught us. Uh, and I think as long as we follow those principles, this city is going to get better and better and better. And so I want to say God bless you and your family. Um, I want to say thank you for what you taught me. Um, oh, I want to say thank you to you and Kathy for always being so kind to Debbie and I. We really appreciated that. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Godspeed with your uh, next endeavor. Uh, I can't wait to see your next success story. Thank you. And uh, Councilwoman Salyer had a long scheduled trip, but I know uh, you know how much uh, she appreciates you. Um, Craig mentioned that everybody up here has been your boss, and that may be true in my case as well today, but unlike everybody else, I was also once your employee. <laughs> And, and though I made longer remarks at your city reception that we had in December, I, uh, I want to reiterate how much you've been a mentor to me. Um, and I think I, when I say that, I speak for a lot of people out in this audience today and really 4,700 city employees. Um, that's one of your greatest legacies is the mentorship and example that you've provided. You know, you, you get the credit for managing outcomes and water and NBA teams and all those things, but you're also primarily responsible and we really depend on you to be responsible for 4,700 employees and managing them and inspiring them and getting them, you know, getting the best possible performance out of them. Um, and I think you just always did, as I said in December, you always did the right thing. And, and you left us each who've served for you or, or with you um, with, a, with a very very deeply held sense of what is the right thing. Um, and I think that's your greatest legacy um, uh, above all those other exterior accomplishments that everybody sees. Which is a good segue, perhaps, to the conclusion of this resolution. Um, and, uh, and with that, I would ask the clerk to read the final three clauses, the, uh, the resolution conclusion. Francis, if you would. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City that they do hereby express their deepest appreciation to James D. Couch for his dedication, integrity, professionalism, and vision during his 31 years of public service to the city of Oklahoma City and wish him the best as he begins to write a new chapter in his life in the city that he loves. And be it further resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City that it is their view that James D. Couch is the finest city manager in the city's history, has served for a record amount of time and during a most historic and successful era, has served as a true public servant and a mentor to countless other public servants. And it is most appropriate that a lasting commemoration be made. And so it is hereby resolved that from henceforth, the office building at 420 West Main be known as the James D. Couch Municipal Office Building and that appropriate signage be created to, denonate, to, to denote it as such. 
and be it further resolved by the Mayor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City that today, January 2nd, 2019, is hereby declared Jim Couch Day in Oklahoma City. To the last, he just reminded me we do need to vote on that. <laughs> so uh, why don't we do that before we let him speak? Um, and, and, and let me add one thing about the naming of the building. You know, my very first day, I told him I wanted to go shake hands of every city employee we could find, and and so he walked with me through that building for two hours, and you know, kept pointing out, you know, this was his office at one time, this was his office. Between that seed that was planted that day thinking about how much of his career he didn't spend in the corner office here at City Hall, but over at 420 West Main, and thinking about, again, what a mentor he's been to city employees. As this all happened, it just became obvious to me that that was what we should do. And um, it's a most fitting place uh, for you to be remembered. Um, with that, I would love uh, a motion and a second. Got a motion and a second. Uh, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Um, and. Uh, I'll also give you this while I still have the mic. In the name of fiscal responsibility, we could have put this over on the building, but I think we'll buy a different sign and we'll let you, <laughs> we'll, we'll let you have this one. But this it's a little worse for wear. I suppose it's been up there for 18 years and probably at some trusts as well, but uh, I think it's, uh, it is a nice little uh, souvenir. So please take this um, and we would love if you would uh, close this out with some thoughts. Well, thank you so much. That, that, that's an amazing honor. I'm, I'm, I'm really a little surprised. Yeah, you all know I'm still alive, right? <laughs> you know, Monday I was talking to Craig Freeman, and uh, Craig was telling me that uh, in his office there's a, there's a sofa, and he is now designated that as the Jim Couch Couch. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that was a that was a pretty nice honor right there. But but apparently uh, this is this is kind of way over the the top, so, so thank you for that. Um, I'm very uh, heartened uh, by the number of, of uh, department heads and city employees that are here today. Um, public service is, is, in my mind, is very much a noble profession, and the dedication of the people that we have in this room are one of the reasons that the city is to, moves forward and, and has had the successes it's had over, over the years. And so i just like to give a hand to all of those that have had my back over the last 18, 31 years, however you want to look at it. So thank you all. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to re, uh, repeat three comments I, I made earlier. Uh, and one is, is, is goes on to what uh, Councilman Greiner said a few minutes ago. But uh, in a recent city survey, we had the, the right track, wrong track numbers for the city were 72%. That's pretty strong. That citizen confidence we have is something we should never take for granted. It takes decades to build. It can be lost in a day. It's what lets us pass MAPS for Kids, MAPS 3, the sales tax extension, the, the geo bond pro programs that we do. And it's really, really important. And if you look around at government right now, 72% of our right track, wrong track numbers is pretty amazing. Uh, state legislature is somewhere in the 20s. Congress is somewhere in the teens right now, and we're at 72 percent. So why is that? And I think it starts with the council. And I think it starts with the civility that James was talking about a few minutes ago and how you get along. And yet, yeah, you're nonpartisan, and that helps a bunch because you don't have teams coming in on, on the start of an issue. So that, that really does help. And there's nine of you. There's not 150 or there's not 500 and whatever we have in Washington these days. And so it's easier to get along and know and understand each other when there's that number. But it's the tone that you set, and that tone is a culture. And I, you've, you've embraced it for years and years and years. And that culture goes and, and uh, penetrates the whole organization. And how you deal with issues, not that you get along or agree on or you get along, not that you agree on every issue, but you, you can have discussions about it and not agree and, and do it in a very civil manner. There, there aren't headlines coming out of council meetings and, and 
and, and video clips of so-and-so saying this and so-and-so saying that. It just doesn't happen. You each treat each other with respect, and it sets the tone for the organization, and it sets the tone for the community. So I thank you for that. And, and don't take those citizen confidence numbers lightly. Those are very, very important. Number two is, is criminal justice. We have an opportunity over the last few years. We've done some great things. LaShawn's here this morning and, and Gaylene from, from courts. What Chief City has done on criminal justice is, is really amazing. Um, we're down 1,000 people in, uh, in, in the county jail. Uh, that isn't by accident. That's very intentional that we, we, we've done that. And it, it's a lot, there's a lot more work to do. And we have issues with mental health. We have issues with substance abuse. Um, and it's going to be hard. And there's going to be people that are tough on crime. And this isn't about letting people not have responsibilities for the crime. It's how you deal with it. And we need to do it in a more compassionate way than we've done in the past. We've got some opportunities in the future. That's a big thing that we need to weigh on over the next several years. And then number three, I would ask you to give Craig the same support you've given me over the last 18 years. Um, it's really important to know that the council is there with you as you're making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, I've had that support, and I know you'll give it to Craig. So again, I just want to thank you. Thank you to all the departments, uh, heads that are here, all the employees that I've had the opportunity to work with over the years, and a special wife to my, uh, thanks to my wife, Kathy, who's put up with a lot over the years. <laughs> Thank you all so very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Kathy. Um, you're still on the job, but you don't have to stay for the rest of the meeting if you don't want to. I want you to enjoy Jim Couch Day. <laughs> so uh, I, I recognize, as I go back to my seat, I recognize some people may shuffle back to the conference room or whatever it is you do. But uh, again, thank you, thank you, thank you for, for your 18 years of service and your three decades of service to the people of Oklahoma City. We appreciate you, Jim. All right, that concludes item three on the agenda. We are now at the uh, item four, Journal of Council Proceedings. We have items A and B. You can take them with one motion. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to item five, request for uncontested continuances. Mayor, we just have one today, and that is on page 17. It's item 9D. It's PUD 1687, and the applicant is actually request to have this withdrawn. Okay. Withdrawn. All right. Item six, revocable permits. There are none today, so we will recess the council meeting, convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority, uh, where we have items A through K. I can take them with one motion. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to page four on the printed agenda. We'll adjourn OCMFA and convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority, where we have three items. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn OCPPA and convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, where we just have claims and payroll. We'll go ahead and take a motion on that anyways. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, reconvene as the council meeting, where we find ourselves at page 5, item 7, the consent docket. And I know we have a presentation for 
Item A0. That's correct. We've got a motion and a second subject to individual consideration. Is there any other item besides A0 that a council member would like to pull out for discussion? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll head right to that presentation. Then. So Doug Cupper is, I'm sure, on his way in if he's not standing at the door. I would not have expected us be here that quick, yeah. So Doug's going to give us a quick update on this item just to give you all a briefing and yeah, you know Doug. what's going on. Boy, you guys are fast this morning. Doug Copper, Director of Parks and Recreation, uh, for the record. Uh, the uh, Boomer Sports Complex on, on 240 has been in existence for quite a few years. I know some of you on the bench have probably actually played softball down there uh, over the years. In working with uh, some of our partner groups, uh, the CVB, uh, the Softball Hall of Famer, the U.S. Softball uh, folks out on uh, Lincoln Park, we wanted to make sure that those eight softball fields stayed in the inventory for consideration. Uh, one of the things that uh, the folks out at the Softball Hall of Fame, as well as the CVB, has spoken not only to me, but to you all, is the need for additional sports complexes operated by the city of Oklahoma City. So when it came up for sale a couple of years ago, we weren't in a position to be able to even talk about acquiring it. Uh, the uh, current owners operated it for about three years. They decided the return on their investment wasn't as high or they didn't want to mess with it anymore. But, but uh, we saw it as a golden opportunity for us to be able to keep those eight softball fields within the inventory that's available not only to us to program through our recreation department and our athletics group, which has been expanding uh, our participation in sports that we are offering, but it also gives us an opportunity for the Softball Hall of Fame not to send uh, teams over to Tulsa or places elsewhere uh, when they uh, get overbooked for their complex here. We want to keep those those players and those participants here in Oklahoma City. The, the opportunity that has arisen is in the 2017 GEO bond, we did put funds in there to uh, do land acquisition and development in three wards, and, and we did it in uh, Ward 4 and um, Ward 3 and Ward 8. So this is an opportunity for us to to uh, capitalize on an opportunity that is available to us um, through those that funding mechanism. So uh, I'd be happy to answer any other questions you might have, but we think that uh, we will be having a return on that investment within three years. We will maximize the investment in five years um, through programming and, and um, regional tournaments and things along those lines. Be happy to answer any questions. So, Doug, I would just like to thank you and your staff uh, for working on this. I do think it's a great opportunity and uh, something we definitely need to support. So, thank you. Any other comments or questions for Doug on that? Okay. And uh, did anyone see anything else they want to pull out? If not, we have a motion on the table. So, any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to the concurrence docket. We have here items A through Q. Are we taken with one motion? Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to item nine, items requiring separate votes. We have some uh, zoning cases here. We've got item 9A. One. These are all that I'm about to roll through ordinances on final hearing that were recommended for approval at the Planning Commission. Item 9A1 is uh, at 2313 Northwest 10th Street, moving from R2 to O1. It's in Ward 6. I don't know if Councilwoman Salyer spoke to anyone. I guess I'll kind of quarterback this. Is there, is there anyone here who wishes to speak on this item? I'll move the item. Okay. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9A2 at 3701 Northwest 192nd, going from AA to PUD 1086. Uh, Councilman Stonecipher. Thank you, Honor. This is an ordinance on final hearing to rezone uh, 192nd Street, 3701 specifically. There were no protests. I'm not aware of anyone that's here today. So I would move the item. All right. Got a motion and a second. 
Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 9A3, 7300 Northwest 164th, going from PUD 1368 to PUD 1698. Councilman Stonecipher. Again, this is a rezoning. On, it's an ordinance on final hearing. There were no protests at the Planning Commission. Planning Commission voted for approval, so I'd move the item. Okay. Is there a second? second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. <laughs> Item 9A4, 13300 North Sarah Road, going from PUD 445, 1578, and 1595 to PUD 1699. Councilman Stone Cipher. Your Honor, I'm going to have to recuse myself from this, and Councilman Stone's going to handle this. Matter. Okay. We'll, we'll pause while you leave the room. Thank Council you, Mayor. Has anyone signed up to speak? No, sir. I'll go ahead and make a motion that we approve this item. All right, we've got a motion. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. See, no, 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 we haven't voted yet. Go ahead. <laughs> Shut the door. <laughs> Sorry, our charter is very specific on this, so that's why we, <laughs> we hewed to that. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. <laughs> now you can come back. <laughs> Um, item 9A, where were we? 9A5, 2808 Northwest 18th Street from R2 to SPUD 1089. This is in Ward 6. Um, has anyone here to speak on this item? Please come forward. If you wouldn't mind stating your name and address. Yes, uh, Fallon Brooks, 1630 North Blackwilder. Um, I really don't know that there's a whole lot to say. Um, I do want to add, we've done a couple of these. And you're the, and you're the applicant, just to. I, yes, technically, okay. for a client, yeah. Got it, got it. Uh, we've done a couple of these now, and it's really just for a garage apartment. That's all we're doing. We're building a new garage with an apartment above it. And the whole uh, SPUD process, I'm not sure if we, uh, if there's a better way to do that. <laughs> okay. So, but I, unless anyone has any specific questions, I don't know that we need to comment on that. I'd move the item. Okay. Second. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, 9B1 and 2, these items are related. The first is an amendment to the master design statement, and uh, 9B2 is an ordinance on final hearing. I thought D was what had... 9D was withdrawn. Yeah, sorry. D is in David. Okay, 9B2 is an ordinance on final hearing. Uh, this is uh, 7600 North Kelly Avenue going from R1 to SPUD 1091. Uh, Councilwoman Nice. Uh, yes, uh, has anyone signed up to speak? We had no protesters, and this is to permit uh, them to add. Uh, break columns around their temple property, so I would move for this to be approved. Okay. I'll take that motion as one for the amendment for 9B1. Yes, 9B1. And uh, we've got a motion and a second on that. Will uh, any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And uh, now I would entertain a motion for 9B2. So moved. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9C, Ordinance on Final Hearing, that was recommended for approval. This is closing an alley west of uh, Broadway and south of Northwest 14th. This is also Ward 6. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none. Entertain a motion. Move. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9D was previously withdrawn. We're at 9E. This is ordinance on final hearing, um, revising the assessment role uh, regarding the OKC Business Improvement District downtown. Um, this is the first time this is appearing on our agenda. So, Craig, do you want to give a quick explanation? Yeah, so we, th this was one where we had just identified that there were a couple of properties that were duplicated. And so it's just a correction. It's just an administrative correction. But we had to come back to the council because it's done in ordinance. Move the item. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9F, this is the third of three meetings. <clears throat> Considering this issue, we had a presentation at the first meeting. Uh, this is relating to uh, 
annual fee assessed on investor-owned utility or rural electric cooperatives. We also had a public hearing at our last meeting. Um, this would be the final hearing. And so, therefore, we could, I could entertain a motion to, for a passage. Got a motion and a second. Is there any uh, discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9G1, this is a public hearing for 9G2. 9G2 is a joint resolution approving the allocation of GEO limited tax bond proceeds in an amount of $600,000 to provide for certain economic development incentives for the expansion of affordable housing opportunities. Uh, this was, uh, we had a presentation on this from Ian Colgan of the Oklahoma City Housing Authority at a previous meeting. This is, uh, the G1 is a public hearing, so I would ask if anyone here wishes to speak on this item. Seeing none, I would uh, entertain a motion for 9G2, which is the joint resolution approving the allocation. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We're now on the last page, uh, page 18 of your printed agenda, 9H and I. Uh, these are related items. Uh, 9H is a resolution approving the incurrence of indebtedness by AQUIT. Uh, 9I is uh, likewise another resolution approving the indebted indebtedness by AQUIT, and I believe we have a presentation. Yes, so Chris Browning, our Water Utilities Director, is going to just give us a brief overview on this and uh, what we're accomplishing with this financing. Good morning and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, oh, the uh, Water Utilities Trust uses a mix of finance, financing options to uh, fund the capital program. Uh, we use long-term debt, commercial paper, cash, about 40% cash, and then we use state revolving funds from the uh, Oklahoma Water Resources Board. The interest rate on the SRF loans are generally about the same as they are for our AAA rated uh, funding. So uh, the, the, the interest is very, very low right now. Uh, there are two types of SRF loans, one for clean water. Uh, the clean water loans are particularly uh, to fund raw water projects or wastewater projects. And then the drinking water uh, funding is for uh, treatment and, and water lines, water treatment and water lines. Uh, this year we submitted two applications to the Water Board for funding through the SRF program. Uh, first is $50 million for clean water funding. Second is $30 million for drinking water funding. Uh, most of those funds will be used for pipelines, uh, the interconnect under the SRF, and then the small line replacement projects where we have aging infrastructure throughout the city and we replace that systematically on an annual basis. Uh, the, the advantage of using an SRF rather than standard uh, long-term debt is on a 30-year on a municipal bond, we have to set aside 10% reserve fund. Um, the SRF does not require any, any reserve fund set aside. So if we borrowed $80 million uh, using normal uh, bonds, normal long-term debt, we would either have to uh, only net 72 or we'd have to borrow 88 to get the same $80 million. So either we have less funds to pay for our capital programs or we pay more interest over that 30-year period. Um, in Oklahoma, the beneficiary of public trust must approve any increase in indebtedness of its trust so today, Council Agenda Items number uh, 9H and I provide the city's resolution to fulfill the state law beneficiary approval requirement. So we would recommend approval. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Those need to be separate items. OK. I'd, I'd move to approve item 9H, please. Okay. I, I would second that, and I would also just make the comment that the Water Utility Trust does an excellent job in managing its debt. Uh, they really look at the most uh, efficient way to borrow money, and it's not uh, always traditional long-term debt, but they're very successful in, in structuring their debt obligations. So, thank you. All right, we've got a motion and a second on 9H. This is for $50 million of indebtedness by Aqua. This requires six votes, uh, six affirmative votes, I should say. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously and with the required number of votes. That leaves us with 9I. Move the item. 
Got a motion and a second for 9i. This is for $30 million of indebtedness by Aquit. Also requires six votes. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously and with the required number of votes. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, that concludes uh, item 9. That brings us to item 10, items from council. Why don't we uh, we'll start with Ward 8. Just briefly, Your Honor, I know I'm the only person that gets excited about lagoon closings. Uh, but the three lagoon closings out at, at Lake Hefner at the CB Cameron soccer fields, um, that is a big deal, and it's going to improve and enhance our soccer fields out there. And that's just the first step, and I want to thank everybody for approving that today. Uh, first of all, I want to say Happy New Year, and to let uh, the community know, Ward 7, we will be having an upcoming forum um, to continue our uh, discussion of, with the developers forum and we'll hear from those who have actually developed in Ward 7. And that's gonna be on January the 8th, uh, beginning at six o'clock at Metro Tech. So we hope people uh, can come and just hear the information. It's not just for Ward 7, but it will be in Ward 7, but it's for the, the community in the city of Oklahoma City, all of those who have interest in, in possibly becoming uh, developers or understanding the development process. You know, uh, we spend a lot of time talking about how proud of our city employees, uh, how proud of them we are, and um, I just kind of wanted to bring something forward. I was uh, invited by some city employees and asked me to, uh, the week before Christmas, to go out and help deliver some new bicycles. And uh, I've got to tell you, when I saw the, uh, the joy on those children's faces, or the gratitude sometimes on the parents' faces, uh, it really meant a lot to me. And uh, I don't know if I was fully in the Christmas spirit, but I'm telling you, after doing that at a couple of houses, I was fully in the Christmas spirit. So I just wanted to say thank you uh, to those employees and ask me for uh, bringing me along for the ride on that. It was great. I'd just like to wish everybody a happy new year and a prosperous 2019. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you very much. This brings us to item 11, city manager reports. All right. And maybe, uh, maybe an apropos moment also to point out that at uh, 5.01 in this room today, all are invited to your swearing in as the, as the next city manager. Um, if anyone wants to access claims and payroll, they can do so at our website under this agenda at okc.gov. Uh, this brings us to item 12, citizens to be heard. Uh, we have Garland Pruitt. And uh, yeah, it, it, on the same topic, Nathaniel Batchelder, you can arrange yourselves however you wish and uh, welcome. And if you wouldn't mind for, your, for the record stating your name and address before each of you speak. Garland Pruitt. 952 North Triple X Road, Choctaw, Oklahoma. And Nathaniel Batchelder, 1000 Northwest 32nd Street, Oklahoma City. 73118. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, our issue is best presented with our brief letter to you, Mayor Holt, uh, which I'll read and then uh, Mr. Pruitt will make some comments. We'll be brief. Dear Mayor Holt, and council members. We appreciate yours and Oklahoma City's support earlier this year commemorating the 60-year anniversary of the Oklahoma City sit-inners. Our interest today is in the naming of Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue in Oklahoma City. Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue is currently so named only in Northeast Oklahoma City between Reno Avenue and Wilshire Boulevard. The same street is still called Eastern Avenue, north of Wilshire Boulevard, and south of Reno Avenue. Dr. King is known around the world for his promotion of nonviolent social change. He received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964 for his advocacy of nonviolence in the American Civil Rights Movement, and over the decades, since then, his example of nonviolent action for social change has been incorporated by movements around the world for social change. Therefore, we propose that all of Eastern Avenue in Oklahoma City be named 
Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue from Edmond in the north down to Moore in the south. Sincerely, both of us. As you can see, even being before you today, change happens. The only thing constant is change. We can't even breathe the last breath of air that we just breathed. Just as we just got that water, just as we got the thunders from your city mayor, just as we got brick town, just as we got our new street cars that we might need scrapers to get that water off for us to continue, change is needed and necessary. We think this would be a good idea for that change to take place. When I reflect upon my short time as NAACP president, I noticed that one time between here and Moore, Moore didn't celebrate Martin Luther King Day. But after a visit, they do that now. We have a relationship in Edmond with the new Chief Younger. Change is inevitable. It's mandatory and necessary for us to fix change and correct those things that we have an ability and an opportunity to do. We come before the City Council today seeking your approval of an expansion that is needed and necessary. Tie these cities together versus have those little hiccups on the end. That's a progressive move. That's a change needed, necessary, and required, and, asked, and only, we can, only ones can do that is you all. We're seeking your support. We're seeking your approval. Hopefully, we can count on you as Oklahoma continue to progress and move forward to fix change and correct those things that we have the power to fix change and correct that makes us a better, better city than anywhere else in the world. Thank you. Open for any questions. Garland, do you, do you, what was the rationale for just restricting it to the, those few? At this point, I really don't know. For some reason, I say we'll give you a little something, but we're going to hook up on the end. I'm more concerned also with that same expansion that we're in, anticipating and expecting from Eastern going back towards 63rd, when we can go from Eastern, should be Martin Luther King, the Air Reno and Yukon, on the development that we see that is taking place with the blessings of the city, we're waiting on it to take place going from Eastern, hopefully, to new Martin Luther King, going back toward Edmond. We understand that the city owns property all through in there and have leased some of it. We're looking for that expansion on the east side as we continue to grow. You have that ability. We're seeking it. It's only a matter of time before it happens. Let's not be aggressive in making those moves at this point and allow this to be the first step in making those things happen. Does, does, is, does anyone know why that was restricted to just uh, Not specifically. I know, you know, there's sometimes resistance, you know, to name, street name changes for reasons that have nothing to do with the honoree. It's just, oh, I've right. got to change all my stationery, or, you know, I've gotten used to this name and all that. So that would be my speculation is that just people said they didn't, you know, right. want it. But it does seem like in other cities, if you have a Martin Luther King, or, I mean, it goes all the yeah. way. Yeah, no, I think it's intriguing. This is the first I've heard of it this morning, but I, I think it's definitely something worth discussing. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, I'm, I'm aware that <laughs> if in Norman, Oklahoma, they could change the name of a Klan street, that we can surely change the name of a <laughs> civil rights icon that died for the cause of inclusion and yeah. progress. Yeah, yeah. We are aware that this will be technically challenging. There are a lot of homes and businesses and properties on Eastern Avenue that need to be probably consulted. It's not going to be done in a month or six weeks. But uh, the first step is this proposal to you, and perhaps a proposal from you all that this is a good idea to move forward on. Thank you, thank you, thank you. OK. Thank you, Jim. Not right now. Okay. Thank you very much. It. Thanks for bringing thank it to, to us. OK. Uh, that brings us to Eric Sanderson. And Mr. <laughs> Mr. Sanderson, if you wouldn't mind uh, Stating your name and address and uh, limiting your remarks to three minutes. My name is Eric Sanderson from 11605 Southwest 3rd Street, Yukon, Oklahoma, but it's Oklahoma City Levitz, 73099. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry for my informal appearance and the informal procedure in which I'll probably introduce what I'm going to say, but I was only made aware of this about two days ago, so I beg your leniency on this. Uh, what I'm here to do today is to propose 
an amendment to a current ordinance and proposal for an adoption of a new ordinance. And both of them concern the oil and gas industry as far as their new exploration and production of new wells within Oklahoma city limits. <coughs> Excuse me. The current restrictions on oil and gas wells require that they be a minimum of 600 feet away from any permanent structure, homes or animals, watershed or public municipality. These ordinances were written over 20 years ago when the oil and gas production industry was operated much differently. Now with the advent of larger rigs and hydraulic fracking, the footprint and space requirements are much larger these days than what they did when this was uh, enacted. So what I'd like to do is propose the amendment of the existing requirement of 600 feet be increased to 1,500 feet. And the current distance to be notified for surface landowners is 1,000 feet. We'd like that extended to 2,000 feet. There's been uh, about 500 people sign a petition in Ward 3, and my apologies to Mr. McAtee, like I said, we've only known about this for two days, so I don't want to come here and blindside you anything, but this does affect everyone in Oklahoma City. Um, the other amendment that we are proposing is an amendment to ban the permanent disposal or deposit of waste or byproducts in the city of Oklahoma City. Currently, they can uh, dump any of their oil and gas waste in the city of Oklahoma City limits. We'd like to prevent that. It's, we're, we're not against the oil and gas industry. I don't want to be seen as that. Uh, it's extremely important to the economy of not only Oklahoma City, but Oklahoma in general. And we're not asking to ban anything they're doing or restrict them. We're just holding them to a little higher standard to reflect the more modern production, how it goes. In 50 of the top largest cities in America, 20 of them have enacted additional or uh, identical legislation, most noticeably being uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Dallas, Texas within the last six months. And so I don't know the exact procedure. If we request this motion to be heard in front of the council, put on the agenda, I, I don't know the procedure. But I have copies for the legislation for everyone here. And that's essentially it in a nutshell. I don't know if you guys have okay. any questions. Thank well, I, I certainly agree with you 100%, but one, one of the things that the oil and gas industry did at the legislature is ban municipalities from making ordinances, I think. Well, as, as I understand, they ban them from preventing it. This doesn't prevent it. This only just makes the restrictions higher. Like I said, the, Texas did the same thing, but Dallas, uh, it was about five months ago, did the same thing. That the city is allowed to uh, enact its own ordinance as far as noise control, setback pollution, and these do not violate any of that. So that would be my question. Is the legislature's preemption? I think you're talking about Title 52 is what it's called, or, or uh, I'm not, I'm not sure. I believe that was the law that. Do you, do you have an opinion on? The provision in the state statute in Title 52 extremely limits what municipalities can do in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. We could explore his desires, but it comes down to whether or not those are reasonable. And I pretty well assure you the oil and gas industry is going to challenge us if we make any changes. Like I mentioned, there is a precedent with you know 20 of the 50 largest municipalities in America all enacting right, these but laws. Right, they're not operating under Oklahoma state law. That's what he's doing. Well, I, 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 yeah, I understand. And, and I certainly don't want to speak in authority on this, but my understanding is that the title in Dallas, more importantly, was almost identical in that they have a very strong oil and gas presence there as well. Are you, are there, is there any other Oklahoma municipality that's? Uh, not that I am aware of, but I believe that Title 52 only went in effect four or five months ago. And so I, I don't know if anyone, I don't think it's a matter of time as opposed to desire. So just to. It's actually been in effect since 2015. 2015? Okay, well, then I, I'm sorry. See. So, so your proposal is just to increase the, the yes. distance? Yes. Uh, so these ordinances were drafted well over 20 years ago. That's as far back as I could go. And, and the oil and gas production was much different 20 years ago than it has become now. And 600 feet, it's another thing like, I don't know if you remember, and it's a completely different issue, but when uh, the company proposed to, to set up a fracking rig next to Lake Hefner, citizens are overwhelmingly opposed to right. this. And 1,500 feet, there are places you're not restricting them. And that's where I think Title 52 is saying that municipalities can't make laws restricting it or banning it, uh, this is just putting more requirements on it, more stringent requirements, which I believe the city of Oklahoma City and any other municipalities well within their rights to do that. 
Well, I, I it, certainly agree with you, and I, I think it's it's hypocritical for the legislature to talk about federal intrusion and then restrict mm -hmm. municipalities from being able to yeah. the, us to go play in many federal government. And, yeah. yeah, right. It's it's something that we would certainly like this council to consider. I, I, I mean, I know it's not an easy issue to deal with, but it's like I said, there is a precedence. I don't believe it's unnecessary. It has been enacted by several other municipalities within the last few years. Okay. Wiley, could you? I mean, could we get? Could you give us an opinion? Well, we can look at his request. It's ultimately going to come down to whether or not they're reasonable. We could implement the changes that we're not prohibited from doing that, but we can only do it as it relates to noise, roads, traffic, and odors. We can require fencing. Um, what about his? But, but if the effect of the ordinance restricts their ability to operate, we're probably going to lose that argument. So if you went from 600 to 1,500 feet, or if you restricted disposal, those... You can't restrict the disposal. That would... For sure. Right. Okay. Are you sure? Because that's another concern of mine personally and all that, that they could use empty wells in Oklahoma City Limits as wastewater disposal wells. They can use the radioactive rock from their catch pits as gravel and, and deposit that on the surface without contamination or without uh, controls for contamination. Now, we're, this doesn't ban any of the transportation materials through the city or anything. That we're, we're, it's, like I said, I, I'm not anti-oil and gas. I'm really not. Well, well, maybe Wiley can take what you've got, what you brought here today, and analyze it under state law. That, that's all we're asking. It's something just to be considered to be recognized. In. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. I'll hand these out when we're done here, I guess. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Carrie Clear. And uh, Ms. Clear, if you wouldn't mind uh, stating your name and address for the record. Good morning. My name is Carrie Clear. I live at 54,000 Lazy Fawn Trail in Mustang, Oklahoma, 73064. And I'm here to follow up on Eric's request. Um, I believe that Mustang and Yukon both have more stringent uh, ordinances uh, where this is concerned. And it's not in the best interest of public health and welfare of the residents in this area to allow drilling. There are four schools and another one under construction within a mile of this drill site. Mustang School Bus Barn is also right there. There are 33 residential subdivisions, six nursing homes and senior living communities, five daycare centers, and 10 churches within the affected area, which is roughly between Southwest 15th to State Highway 152 and Mustang Road to Frisco Road. The urban sprawl in this area has exploded in recent years. Mustang added more than 7,000 residents and Oklahoma City in Canadian County grew from 18,711 to 44,491 before the 1990 and 2010 censuses. Since 2010, there have been seven new subdivisions with between 100 and 200 homes each and a 200-unit apartment complex built in the affected area. One of the newest uh, subdivisions, Mustang Ridge, is currently added 256 homes on an 80-acre plot at 44th and Chekhal Road. The roads and infrastructure for, are also underway for new additions on Cemetery Road and Ledgestone on Southwest 59th between Mustang and Chekhal Road has just cleared another section for more houses. There are also commercial businesses increasing along Cemetery Road and Mustang Road. There's only one Oklahoma City fire station to respond in the event of an accident, explosion, leak, or earthquake. In the event of an accident or other critical event at the well site or along the horizontal lines, emergency response would likely be pushed to Mustang and or Yukon, which both only have one fire department. The boundary line between Oklahoma City and Mustang is Southwest 59th. It's such an event extended into Mustang that would make emergency response even more limited as their priority would be to respond within their city limits before assisting Oklahoma City. Several homes in this area are serviced with well water. Fracking and wastewater wells have been conclusively linked to well water and environmental contamination. In addition to the wells, there are several creeks and farm and duck ponds. The air, noise, water, and other environmental pollution caused by horizontal drilling has been proven as hazardous within a mile and a quarter of drill sites. 
Traffic in this area is increasing each year with the construction of new homes and schools. The two lane roads in this area are narrow with no shoulders, very tight turn radiuses, and are in generally poor condition. There are no road improvement projects scheduled until 2025, and that's a simple resurfacing project of Check Hall Road between Southwest 44th and Southwest 29th. Adding large oil field equipment and trucks to the school buses, regular traffic, and emergency vehicles is a huge safety concern. At the beginning of December, we started a paper petition protesting drilling at this location. And just before Christmas, we started an online petition. Together, we've gathered more than 500 signatures so far. We also posted our concerns with this drilling location on the nextdoor.com website, which serves residents in the area. And I've attached uh, copies of the comments from both of these websites to show the level of concern from the citizens in this area. So I just ask that you give this consideration. And Oklahoma City in Canadian County, we're growing just as quickly as Oklahoma City is growing is on the north side, if not faster. Um, and we, you know, there are, know that there is a planned fire station going in on um, Richland Road, I believe, at 44th. Um, but it's, it's not there yet. So the schools, all the students in that area, the bus traffic with the, the bus barn being right there, um, is there's, there's nowhere, there's no room for these large industrial uh, trucks and equipment on those two lane roads with our school buses. And I have copies of all this information. Okay, maybe we can get that to Wiley for sure afterwards. Okay. okay. Do you have any questions for me? No, thank you. And Terry Botchlet? And if you wouldn't mind also stating your name and address. Thank you. And Good morning. My name is Terry Botchlet, and I'll just read what I've got here. So I live 4101 South Checkhaw Road, and I've lived there for 40 years. And when I moved out there, all these roads were dirt roads then. Several months ago, I was here to, to protest a variance to allow two residences per five-acre tract. One of the main points then was, and still is, our water. You protected us then, protect us again. This new, this new uh, proposal that we, that we have brought up would help protect our water and earthquake protection, street safety, and construction of our roads. This fracking process was developed for the open plains of the Dakotas, not municipal Oklahoma City. If allowed to frack in the area known as no man's land, west of Council, between Reno and 59th, our water table could be destroyed, and once it's gone, it will never be, good, never be brought back. You, the Oklahoma City Council, has the last permitting authority over these rigs. They have to go through uh, Corporation Commission, but when it comes down to the final permit, it has to come from Oklahoma City as to whether they can do it or not. That's why we're here today. And you've told us that we'll, we will not ever get water out there where we're at right now. I don't know if ever is a bad word, but we've come before you two or three times, and it's just not cost effective out there on those acreages. But we are still in Oklahoma City under your protection, and that's where we'd like to keep it. And then we invest in our own water wells. But what happens if this catastrophe hits, and it will eventually, somewhere under this aquifer, just and there with the earthquakes that, and I don't have the numbers yet, but I'm going to get them from the geological survey. As soon as this starts fracturing the ground, is Oklahoma City going to be responsible for bringing us clean water? I don't think so. After giving permission to do this procedure, the oil company sure won't. They'll just change their names, claim bankruptcy, and move on to the next uh, city like they've done in Choctaw, Deer Creek, Bridge Creek, and now they're right here between Mustang and Yukon. Um, I also align this sort of with what happened in Flint, Michigan, the problem with their lead pipes. They, ended, they couldn't, they had to take them all completely out. The same will happen here with our water supply. There's no replacing this water. And they had to file a class action lawsuit and then the taxpayers ended up paying to have all of the lines taken out and put back. Mustang and Yukon have similar ordinances to keep fracking out of their city limits 
which, uh, which explains why no man's land is the target now. Please protect us as our neighbors within two miles of us are from, the city, from their city councils. These horizontal wells and fracturing cause a lot of damage to homes, water, roads, and put many children and seniors in danger. Uh, please try to uh, consider this uh, proposal and, uh, and the changes that go with it. We desperately need it out there because they're going to just keep drilling and fracking all over out there until somewhere it happens bad. And the whole thing is under one aquifer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that concludes the citizens who signed up to be heard. Uh, anyone else wish to speak? Seeing none, we are uh, completed with our business today. That brings us to item 13, adjournment. And so we shall. The council meeting is adjourned.